Hello and welcome. Tonight is a breath of fresh air for 11 of the passengers kidnapped on the Kaduna bound train on March the 28th following their release from captivity today. Governor Akiri Dolu faults federal government's claim that ISWAP might be behind Sunday's deadly attack on a church in Owo, Ondo State, describes it as hasty conclusion. Fuel scarcity bites harder in the federal capital territory. Motorists pay more for the product as many petrol stations remain shut. Thousands of protesters troop out across the United States to call for stricter gun laws following last month's mass shooting in Texas. On business news tonight, Central Bank of Nigeria plans to introduce USSD code for e-Naira transactions. On sports news tonight, European champions Real Madrid FC announced the signing of France midfielder Aurelien Chouameni from Monaco for a fee of $84 million, as well as an additional $21 million in bonuses. Seven out of the 61 persons kidnapped during the March 28th train attack in Kaduna State have regained their freedom from the hands of the abductors after over two months in captivity. Malam Tuka Mahmoud, the spokesman of the Kaduna-based Islamic cleric, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, who has been involved in the negotiation for the release of the victims, told Channels Television that the freed victims are six females and five males. He said the victims were released at a forest and have been flown to the nation's capital, Abuja. He gave the names of them as Jesse John Amina Baba Mohammed, Rashida Yusuf Busari, Amina Jubril, and Hannah Ajewole. Others are Najib Mohammed, Daharu, Jayos Gambo, Hassan Haliu, Peace Boy, and Danjuma Saidu. Eight people lost their lives while 26 others sustained injuries during the attack. Victims of, of the train attack, uh, though not all of them, uh, 11 of them, were successfully rescued uh, as a result of uh, a series of engagements and dialogue uh, with the abductors. Um, it's a very, very difficult process but uh, it has been achieved at the end of the day and that is to show you uh, how the power of the dialogue and engagement uh, can succeed uh, against uh, any use of military force especially in a situation where you know lives of innocent citizens uh, are involved uh, so far uh, the victims i can confirm they have been turned to abuja and receiving uh, medical evaluation and treatment, uh, and then they are under the care of the, of the federal government. The whole thing was coordinated, organized uh, by, by the federal government, and it, it went smoothly. Uh, confidence has been built, and we have great hopes that in the next few weeks, inshallah, uh, all the remaining victims uh, will, will regain freedom, especially, you know, taking into cognizance, you know, the, the, the efforts and then renewed determination of government to ensure that all the victims uh, regain their, their freedom as, as soon as possible. Meanwhile, kidnappers in Anambra State appear to be feeling the heat from the state government as it has demolished their den in Oba Idemili South local government area. The action is carried out in collaboration with the state police command for Governor Chukuma Soludo. Any building used as a criminal hideout in the state will suffer similar fate. Anambra State has had troubling times with violent crimes like kidnapping and armed robbery. The governor's resolve to smash them, however, is beginning to yield results as several criminal hideouts, including this old bungalow in Oba, Idemili South local government area, where kidnapped victims are held hostage. 
leading the operation, the state's joint security team conducts the demolition exercise, which lasted over five hours, and with several exhibits recovered, including arms, charms, bloody concoctions, hard drugs, and other fetish items. The joint security team had earlier stormed the den and rescued three victims, including a reverend father. This time, two kidnapped suspects have been arrested. Afterwards, an excavator arrives to demolish the entire building, including the fence. Reacting to the development, Governor Saludo restates that the government is determined to take back the state from criminal gangs. Anyone, no house, no bush, no location in Anambra will be safe to kidnap us and these criminals that are leashing by our land. And consequently, any bush, any land, any house where anyone is caught, these criminals are caught, we will put those darkness. And so, Pursuant to the law, uh, anti-kidnapping law in Anambra State, the house that was used as a den for these kidnappers, uh, where they kept their victims and so on, um, immediately that was discovered, that house by law was confiscated by government. The governor appeals to the people of Anambra to be security conscious at all times and report any suspicious movement or strange people in their communities to relevant authorities. In a related development, this time in Adamawa State, where the commissioner of police, Siki Rakonde, is giving the assurance that his officers and men remain relentless in the effort to rid the state of kidnappers and other criminals. Mr. Akonde stated this while parading some suspects arrested by the police during recent raids on criminal hideouts across the state. According to him, the command has over time improved in its intelligence gathering techniques to meet all security challenges in the state. As part of measures to honor the victims of Sunday's attack on the Catholic Church in Owo, the Ondo State Government has canceled this year's Democracy Day celebration, stated for tomorrow, June the 12th. This is to enable the people mourn their loved ones who died in the horrific church attack. The state government had earlier directed that all flags be flown at half mass for seven days in the state. This comes as Governor Rutimi Akiridulu faltered the suggestion by the federal government that the terrorist group, Islamic State West Africa Province, ISWAP, was behind the deadly attack at St. Francis Catholic Church. He says the conclusion came too quickly and adds that if they have done it, they would have owned up. We are yet to know the identity and our security people are still on their trail. According to the governor, the attack is a crime against humanity as the southwest region has been a peaceful haven before this horrific incident. Meanwhile, Nobel laureate Professor Walesho Inka has described the terror attack in a war as a message from people who are obsessed with domination. The renowned playwright who paid a condolence visit to the governor in his office in Akure says the attack targeted Governor Akire Dulu for showing leadership in terms of internal liberation. In his words, it was not an accident as it is passing a message to the rest of us. That is why I'm here. I want the governor to know that we have received the message. We understand it and we came to sympathize with him that he was selected as a medium of that message. Governor Akiri Dulu appreciated Professor Shoinka for the condolence visit and echoes his sentiments, emphasizing that the attack is like a dagger drawn to the heart and on the psyche of the people in the southwest and western region. The attack in Owondo State, the first to occur in such a scale at the southwest, has indeed triggered discussions on the atrocious action and the motive of the attackers. In this next report, our correspondent, Aurelu Ashonibare, poses questions arising from the incident and the bigger picture on the challenge of insurgency in the country. The level of carnage that occurred at St. Francis Catholic Church in Obondo State on June the 5th 
has sparked a conversation that perhaps should have started before now. Cases of bombings and mass shootings are usually witnessed in the northern region of Nigeria. But with the latest incident in the southwest, there are questions being asked about the why, where, what, who, and when. Why is this happening? The motive behind this attack that snuffed out the lives of men, women, and children makes it difficult for many not to insinuate that an agenda is in place to create fear and control the narrative by any means necessary. Where did the assailants come from? Where was the police that this attack took place? Where was the security outfit codenamed Namotekun, which governors of the Southwest commissioned to complement the efforts of protecting people? Namotekun Corps is a complementary corps. We are to complement what is on ground so that together we can achieve the goal of a safer environment. As a government, we're leaving no stone unturned to make it, it a state free of crime and criminality because the primary assignment of every government is the protection of lives and property of the citizenry. What strategy will the military come up with to contain this extension of violence? Because there's already a struggle to cope with the challenge in the north, which was at one time voiced angrily by the governor of Bono State. The Nigerian army and the Nigerian police cannot co protect commuters within a distance of only 20 kilometers for the last two years. I cannot foresee the capacity of the Nigerian army in defeating the insurgents in the state. Who do the attackers represent? The bigger picture behind the calculated killings, which began in the north and now making its way down south, may not just be the idea of some unknown gunmen. And the federal government's recent comments suggesting that ISWAP may be behind the attacks opens the door to a room filled with conspiracy theories. The animals in ISWAP wanting attention and recognition are suspected to have, to, to have launched that attack. And we have, uh, we have directed all the agencies concerned to go after them and bring them to justice. When will this end? Nigerians are united in their condemnation of this dastardly act and in their optimism that peace will reign eventually. And so, for those taking pride in killing innocent people to achieve a goal that remains unclear, it may just be time to beat a retreat. Orolu Ashunibare, Channels Television News. More reactions on the church attack. The Catholic Archbishop of Lagos, Most Reverend Adewale Martins, is challenging security agencies to do more in the area of intelligence gathering to avert a recurrence. He was speaking after the Diocesan Synod at the St. Agnes Catholic Church in Maryland, Lagos. There is a lot of worry that our government is not doing enough that our security agencies need to do a lot more than they are doing now. We feel that if there, are, if there are intelligence activities going on, much of this would have been detected even before they happened. If it does happen at all, there is not adequate effort made to ensure that, that uh, those who, who, who engage in such, in such deadly uh, uh, attacks are brought to book. And we are just hoping that our government will respond to this uh, concern of our people at this point in time. Of course, we know that uh, it is not just simply a security agency effect. All citizens need to also rise up. As I say, if you see something, say something. But, but people need to be given the confidence that if they come up with information, that those, the information will be used appropriately and that they will not in turn be the ones that will become... Uh, uh, victims. In part two, after the break, Governor David Umwahi of Eboi State blows hot over the just concluded APC presidential primary, berates his kinsmen for selling out, says the nation's structure is skewed against the Igbos. That's in a moment. Join us again.
you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. It's a breath of fresh air for 11 of the passengers kidnapped on the Kaduna bound train on March the 28th, following their release from captivity today. Governor Akiri Dolu false federal government's claim that ISWAP might be behind Sunday's deadly attack on a church in Owa Ondo State, describes it as hasty conclusion. Fuel scarcity bites harder in the federal capital territory. Motorists pay more for the product as many petrol stations remain shut. Thousands of protesters troop out across the United States to call for stricter gun laws following last month's mass shooting in Texas. Politics now. The recently concluded All Progressive Congress primary is generating reactions from one of the aspirants, that's the governor of Ebony State, David Umayi, who says the setting on which Nigeria operates is skewed against the Southeast and the Igbo man. The chairman Southeast Governors Forum also berated leaders and delegates from the region for being sellouts during the APC primary in the nation's capital. The governor made these comments while delivering his speech at the maiden matriculation ceremony of the King David University of Medical Sciences in Uburu. Whereas other geopolitical zones have six and seven states, the Igbo man has five states. And we should be asking why. Is there any fairness and justice in this regard? Whereas other states have over 30, 40 local government areas, our own state has just 13 local governments. But the worst is the betrayal of our leaders and the delegates. I wept internally and externally for the behavior of our delegates and our leaders. I know I have meeting with the five Southeast chairmen and the NBC of Southeast, and I told them it's not about me. It's about the agitation. It's about the mood of the nation. And I beg them, vote for any candidate of Southeast so that when our votes are counted, behind all the contestants of Southeast, we should not have anything less than the number of our delegates. By so doing, we would have made a statement. But it became a shame that our leaders and the delegates sold all our votes. It is a very big shame, and let me say it publicly, for our people to be shouting on marginalization. And whenever they have opportunity to make a statement, they will sell the votes. I continue to let them know that he that says his brother or his sister, even the buyers will never trust him or her. It's a big shame. The Lagos State Governor, Babajide Songwulu, has returned from Abuja after the All Progressive Congress presidential primary and special convention. Governor Songwulu was received by party supporters at the presidential wing of the Muritala Mohammed Airport, says Chief Bola Ahmed Tinumbu's victory as the presidential flag bearer of the APC is a win for all Nigerians. He says the party is satisfied with the choice of Chief Tinumbu, whom he describes as a detribalized Nigerian. So we're indeed very happy and excited. But I think first, after thanking God, it's really, really to thank the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, who at all of events, at all of events, you know, um, kept it to his word, said he was going to have an open, transparent, um, um, free and fair process. And he led from the front. He did ensure that we had a free and fair contest that Aona Shiwaju Paul Ahmed Tinubu emerged victorious. It's to use his experience 
um, his dexterity of knowledge, his transformational leadership, and his ability to have led Lagos at a very difficult time, to which all of us, our testament, have, uh, have seen fiscally what has become of Lagos in the last 20 years. Right? Lagos has continued to remain and continue to grow as the home of commercial, economic, and nerve center of our country. It continues to be the, the melting point of our country. And that's what the leadership of Ashwaja had brought to us in Lagos. And we believe with that kind of a background, with that kind of a pedigree, right, he is a completely detrapalized Nigerian, a completely um, 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 non-religious, as it were. He cuts across religious divide. And he has made friends, he has made compatriots, he has made leadership across all strata of life in the country. He will be going with those wealth of experience to chart a new direction and a new course for our country, Nigeria. Ahead of the 2023 general elections, more non-state actors are taking up various roles to ensure a successful electoral process. Women in Management, Business and Public Service, WIMBYs, has organized a mock presidential debate, an initiative of the WIMBYs Women in Politics WIMPO Mentoring Program. The hybrid event, which is born out of the advocacy pillar of WIMBYs, is aimed at bringing women together for visibility and strategic positioning for future political offices, while they profess real-life solutions to the challenges facing the country. There have been calls for more representation of women around the decision-making table, and Wimbers appears to be walking the talk by amplifying the voices of the women seated in this hall for a mock presidential debate under the 2022 Wimbers Women in Politics Mentoring Program. So when you keep doing something and you see that... The platform is aimed at giving women more insight into the rudiments of politics and what it takes to win a ticket. Mentees from three mock political parties take the stage to pitch their manifestos to the online and on-site audience whose votes they seek. I do not come with titles, but I come with the hope to restore this great nation. I will restore Nigeria and I will not fail you. I'm going to transform the security, I'm going to transform the electricity, I'm going to transform the transportation channels and as, as well as uh, information. <laughs> Their race approaches a turning point as voters now go on to cast their votes. Four, N -U -P. Five, N -U -P. Six, A -N -P. Seven, -L -D -P. By the powers conferred on me by Wimpo, Wimpies, Wimbies, I hereby declare. Ola Shade Aduni Koka of Awake Nigeria Party, the winner of this election. Thank you. With a total of 188 votes, Fola Shade Aduni Koka of the Awake Nigeria Party emerges president-elect, beating two contenders from the Nigerian Unified Party and the leading leader's Democratic Party. My dear people, Make no mistake, united we can and will overcome the season of darkness in our land. We will choose hope over fear, facts over fiction, and fairness over privilege. So the question for us is simple, are we ready? As preparations for the 2023 general elections pick up pace, the organizers also harp on the need for all to get their permanent voter cards. So I am so proud of what Wimbis is doing, and I say two thumbs up indeed to Wimbis for this. He's brought it home for me. So anyone who's been in the room today who didn't have a PVC will be gingered, if you permit my use of the word, to get up and go and register. This is something that is going to be ongoing. This is our first. We're going to have a second stream, a third stream, until we have enough pipeline of women who are confident, who have the courage, right, to actually say, look, I want to stand for president or governor. Wimbiz says it seeks to paint a hopeful vision of the nation's future with initiatives such as this to help reshape Nigeria's political landscape. Youths in Lagos gather at the Tafa Balewa Square for the Youth Vote Count Mega Music Concert, 
organized by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in collaboration with the European Union and other partners. The event is a climax of a campaign which began on Monday, June the 6th, to encourage young people to participate in the electoral process. Access to the concert is free, but attendees are required to have their permanent voter card or temporary voter slip to enter the venue. Some of the artists and influencers present to motivate the young people to partake in the general elections are Mr. Macaroni, Pasuma, Waje, Amaomi, Real Worry Pekin, Kiki, Small Doctor, amongst others. Although there is no PVC registration there today, the crowd was given the opportunity and the assurance that the process would continue in 20 local government areas in Lagos State, with more machines deployed. We are passing the message across that the only way they can make a difference the only way they can use their numbers to make a difference in our democracy is to register, collect their PVCs and vote. And that is the only way the youth can answer to the criticisms against them. And can keep saying that, oh, don't mind this uh, generation of youth. They, they are not interested in politics, they only complain. But we are now saying, let us change the narrative. And how can we change the narrative? We can change the narrative by getting those they believe in to talk to them. And that is why we have this concert today, being organized by a group of civil society organizations in partnership with the European Union, in partnership with INEC. During the week, we said, come here and register. And we saw enthusiasm. Many of them started coming out. So we hope that through this concert, the message will get across to many young people that their power lies in their votes. But that vote cannot be cast if they don't have their PVCs. Seven years after President Mohamed Buhari promised to quickly defeat corruption, some Nigerians are still in doubt about how successful the anti-graft war has been. In continuation of our Democracy Day series, our State House correspondent, Gloria Mezuke, looks at the President's effort in the fight against corruption as his eight-year tenure winds down. The fight against corruption is one tripod upon which the present administration set its agenda seven years ago. The other two are insecurity and the economy. Especially on corruption, serious financial crimes or abuse of office. In 2021, Nigeria ranked 154 out of 180 countries listed in Transparency International's Corruption Index. Not only is Nigeria down five places from its 2020 ranking, its total score of 24 out of a maximum 100 points represents a drop for the third successive year. One, two, Section 15, subsection 5 of the 1999 Constitution compels the federal government to act. It says the state shall abolish all corrupt practices and abuse of power. Anti-corruption pundits identify politics and a lack of preventive strategies as a major concern. Which is why we said focus on corruption prevention. We all know the faucet is leaking. Everybody's coming to fetch. So fix the faucet. Don't get into the trap of chasing everybody with a blala and saying nobody should come here and fetch. That approach to fighting corruption has never worked in our history. That is six states in the country. And you cannot say your government, you are fighting corruption, and your governors in the same party are not even replicating the fight against corruption institutions and agencies like you have at the federal level. In November 2021, the government, in a bold move to hold cases of illegal recruitment, racketeering and diversion of public property by civil servants, revealed nearly 300 duplicated projects amounting to 20.1 billion naira uncovered in the 2021 budget. To highlight the importance of anti-corruption for socio-economic growth, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has arrested and detained some public office holders, the latest being the immediate past Accountants General of the Federation and the former Governor of Imo State, Senator Rochas Okorocha. Yes, we can chase the um, Accountant General, but even the previous one who returned $6 billion. So if you returned $6 billion, how much did you take? 
So we, we have a whistleblowing policy where people um, said um, monies were collected back. We haven't really been able to piece together yet. What is the policy? The inability of the Nigerian security forces to secure the country's northern region from a 12-year insurgency is also linked to corruption, especially as the situation spreads to the southern region. A lot of money has been taken in the name of security boards. A lot of money has been taken in the name of procuring security arms and ammunition. But Nigerians have not been protected, have not been, you know, secured. And this is one of the major gaps that you have also in the fight against corruption, where you have corruption, you know, uh, growing in the security sector. The Nigeria Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, NATI, estimates that between $15 billion and $18 billion leaves as illicit financial outflows yearly. In a move to prevent corruption, the president assented to three bills, Proceeds of Crime Recovery and Management Bill 2022, the Money Laundering Prevention and Prohibition Bill 2022, as well as the Terrorism Prevention and Prohibition Bill 2022. We will not rest until we rid the nation of the menace of money laundering, terrorism and other financial crimes. The EFCC also secured 2,220 convictions in 2021, 127.5% higher than the 1,280 secured in 2019. It also recovered 152.86 billion naira and $386.22 million. But Nigerians believe more can be done. Except you find and you articulate a clear vision and you show people operationally how day to day you can save them from that, then people say, OK, this is viable. So what should yes. be the vision? The vision should clearly be that as a result of doing the right thing, you are able to progress within Nigerian society. Given the pervasiveness of corruption in the country, Nigeria now needs more than just commitments, but active participation from the national and state assembly, the judiciary, executive, state and local governments must also play a role. The success of the existing policies, laws and agencies, it is agreed, most logically depends on the right leadership at every level. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Motorists in the nation's capital are expressing worry over the lingering long queues at petrol stations in the federal capital territory. For over a month now, there has been scarcity of premium motor spirit, also known as petrol, in Abuja, with only fuel stations selling the product. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, has this report. Long queues at filling stations are becoming a common sight in the federal capital territory as custody of petrol persists. In most cases, motorists have to wait for hours to buy the product. If you go to some of the satellite and now, you see them selling it for 185, 200. It's only in the Gallic area that you can see it for 165. So, yeah. Last week, I traveled to Benin. You just enter to the station, buy your fuel, a month before, I think I traveled to Ibadan, enter to the station, buy the fuel as you want. But so unfortunate is what's happening in Abuja. And nobody is like coming as if nobody is just there to correct your thing. Has it become normal? Has it become law that this has to be in Abuja? However, while motorists struggle to buy fuel, black marketers make brisk sales. This seller says he has to pay as much as 2,500 naira to get 10 liters of fuel, which he in turn sells for around 3,000 naira or more. Some motorists blame the government for not doing much to address the situation. Can you imagine? You can see people outside the filling station with the gallon. We're surprised. Where are they getting the fuel? We that we are in the queue. Since in the morning we joined the queue, we will not get the fuel. Since I've had that polluted oil, the government is deliberately doing what it's doing because they want to increase prices. People are not happy with the increase, so they made it to frustrate people. They will say one thing today, say another thing tomorrow. 
They tell us that the fuel is available. But where are the fuel? Reacting to the situation, the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria, IPMAN, attributes it to a lack of equilibrium between supply and demands. The supply is not enough for one NPC. So the supply is not enough. And uh, at the same time, the PEP issue. You see, a lot of people cannot run their vehicles on uh, the cost of diesel. It's becoming so high. And uh, in, in terms of that, fuel has not been coming mostly to this uh, Abuja environment. Because uh, the cost of running Lagos, lifting fuel from Lagos to Abuja is enormous. So that's why we are having this. However, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has released a weekly national PMS evacuation report from May the 30th to June the 5th, 2022. According to the report, which was released via their company's verified Twitter handle, a total of 556.71 million liters of the product were evacuated from various depots across the country. It adds that the Federal Capital Territory received 20.353 million liters in the previous week. It's a tale of worries, concerns and uncertainties as motorists in the nation's capital continue to go through difficulty to access fuel. The big question is how long this is going to last before solutions are provided by the appropriate authorities. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. To health matters now, the Adewumi Desalu Parkinson's Foundation and Parkinson's Africa have held an awareness walk in Lagos. The purpose is to let people know what the disease looks like and stop the stigma around it. Our correspondent, Mary Alale Yusuf, has read this report. Members of the Adewumi Desalu Parkinson's Foundation, ADPF, and Parkinson's Africa braved the rain to go on this walk. Level. You go higher, you go higher. Accompanying them from the ADPF center are their supporters and a retired British colonel, Guy Deacon, who, in spite of being diagnosed with Parkinson's, refuses to let it stop him from fulfilling his dream to drive from England to different parts of Africa. This walk is not like most, proceeding slowly, because Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease which affects movement, manifesting in trembling and a compromised gait. Back at the foundation, people with Parkinson's tell their stories and talk about the disease. I want you to be aware of what Parkinson's looks like. I want you to understand it, I want you to see it, I don't want you to be afraid of it. Rachel Agu has found soccer in Parkinson's Africa and can't hold back the tears. You can go through life, no matter what life throws at you, you can. If I could be standing now, you can't stand. So please see us, not the business. Mrs. Agumbi Ade, who has been caring for her husband since he was diagnosed 10 years ago, has a word of advice. Parkinson, like any other diseases, needs maintenance. And when you are maintaining it with the proper de uh, medication as prescribed by your doctor, you will live successfully with it. For Guy Deacon, living well with Parkinson's disease cannot be complete unless people understand the struggles beyond the symptoms they see. What people don't understand is what it means inside our bodies. They know the motor problem about walking badly, zips and buttons, but they don't understand what it's like to feel it and the effect it has on your mind and how it actually causes deep depression sometimes and a reluctance to engage with friends and people. And that's one of the saddest things about it. It's the secret bits and pieces about the having Parkinson's that people don't know because we tend to hide it away. And that is really bad. And I'm trying to expose to people what it feels like to have it, not what it looks like to have it. The sooner there's a diagnosis and the sooner the, the, sooner the medication begins, you can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. 
Parkinson's disease may progress with time, but those living with it in Nigeria are being taught that it can be managed and they can live a better life as they come out of hiding and attempt to stop the stigma. Mary Alale Yusuf, Channels Television News. The London to Nigeria biker, Mr. Kunle Adeoju, has been speaking on the need for everyone to join the fight to totally eradicate polio from the country, just as he narrates his experience while his trip lasted. According to Mr. Adeoju, who was hosted to a reception in Ilori, Dokwara State Capital, the motivation for the trip is to highlight the need to bring down the level of vaccine hesitancy in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. After completing what could be described as an arduous 41-day bike trip from London to Lagos to raise funds to fight polio in Nigeria, 44-year-old Kunle Adinoju arrives in Kwara State capital where his friends put together this reception for him in Fateh area of Ilori to welcome him home. The ride took him through 13 countries as well as 42 major cities covering 12,000 kilometers. He highlights the motivation for embarking on this voyage. For me, doing this was basically to achieve two purposes. One, which is to, you know, communicate the end polio message, to raise awareness about it, to actually see how we can improve the level of vaccine acceptance. You know, bring down that issue of hesitancy. That's objective one. The second objective was also to raise funds. While describing the trip as one filled with challenges, he says he is happy he made it to Nigeria. It's been extremely difficult, but one thing I said to myself is, um, Whatever it takes, I won't quit. Whatever it takes, I won't quit. And that's why I'm here, because I didn't quit. Meanwhile, the organizers of the reception say Mr. Adeoju has drawn attention to the need to fight the polio scourge to its logical conclusion. He wrote not just for the fun of it. He wrote to create awareness and to raise funds that will be channeled towards polio eradication worldwide. A little while ago, you remember Nigeria was certified polio free to make at African region polio free in the global map. We still have polio disease in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and until every child is free from polio we must never relent. The rider is equally appealing to well-meaning Nigerians to touch people's lives in positive ways whenever they have the chance to do so. 300 million naira, that's the target of the Nigeria Solidarity Support Fund to improve access to health care for vulnerable groups in the country. This was made known at the NSF 2022 awards and recognition event which held to honor individuals and corporate donors for their stellar contributions to the cause. A simple yet significant event organized by the Nigeria Solidarity Support Fund NSSF to celebrate outstanding individuals who supported its vision to build a healthier Nigeria. The NSSF raises funds and initiates interventions to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on vulnerable groups in the country. What we've always aimed for since the beginning of uh, this uh, organization was to complement what the federal and state governments are doing. The fund is equally vested in sensitization and creating awareness of its functions to get more and more Nigerians, both at an individual and corporate level, to sign up and join the effort to contribute to national development. Five individuals and corporate donors that have supported the fund are recognized for their stellar contributions. The categories are NSSF Corporate Sponsor Award presented to Tengen Family Office, Female Sponsor Award given to Dr. Dorisa Deria Wushika, Corporate Partner Award, won by Olani Wuajai, LP. Sponsor Award, presented to Mr. Tunde Falario, and the NSF Ambassador Award, won by Mr. Anthony Oputa. I thank you very much. It has come as a surprise. But more important, really surprised, honestly. I didn't get an inkling of this kind of thing. But I thank God Almighty for giving me the grace to receive this. 
The fund understands that its objectives cannot be achieved in silos, and so, at the 2022 awards and recognition ceremony, there's a call for new donors to join the cause. 10 million naira. COVID has highlighted that the struggles are real and they could lead to death if we have, you know, an assault to the economy like we had in COVID. So we're going to continue supporting vulnerable Nigerians. We're going to continue strengthening the health system. Um, we are going to go beyond vaccinations to actually strengthen the health system, improving the quality of care that um, is being given in our primary health care center. And we're going to reskill Nigerian youth. The goal is to raise over 300 million naira which will be used to transform health outcomes in Nigeria by improving access to quality health care for over 100,000 vulnerable women and children. To find out what's happening in the world of business, here is Anne Wawudu. Thank you, Melinda. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has announced plans to introduce the unstructured supplements, supplementary service data, which is the USSD code, to boost the adoption of the e-Naira. The CBN says the introduction of the USSD code is to ensure financial transactions for people without smartphones and in areas where low internet connectivity exists. And this, according to the Apex Bank, will enable the onboarding of the e-Naira and further deeping financial inclusion in Nigeria. It also states that it is working with telcos and the Nigerian Communications Commission to conclude this integration. Meanwhile, people can buy airtime, data and pay other bills through select electronic payment platforms. Nigeria's foreign exchange reserves has recorded its first growth in five weeks, and that's according to latest data published by the Central Bank of Nigeria. The forex reserves increased by $56.35 million week on week to $38.52 billion as of June the 9th. Some analysts believe that although the CBN has enough liquidity to support the forex market over the short term, foreign inflows are paramount for sustained FX liquidity over the medium term. Well, let's talk about trading activities at the forex market. It was negative this week. The market closed in opposite direction from last week as a total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX port forwards and futures market all fell by 66.08% to $571.61 million. And that's as of June the 10th. A further analysis of this trading result shows that total value of transactions at the FX port market fell by about 65% to $432.24 million, while the FX derivatives market turnover declined by 67.76% to $139.3 million. Meanwhile, the Naira depreciated by 0.1% to 419 Naira 34 cobble against the dollar at the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange window of the FX market. And that's in contrast to the 418 Naira 92 Kobo recorded last week. Positive sentiments returned to the domestic equities market this week. Investors took advantage of the moderation in share prices last week to make re-entry into sound companies with attractive dividend yields. The All Share Index inched higher by 0.55% week on week to close at 53,201.3 points. Bargain hunting in MTN Nigeria, Union Bank, Lafarge and Presco all drove the weekly gain. However, activity levels went weaker than in the previous week. Trading volume and value declined by 93.6% and 90.7%. Performance across sectors was mixed as the oil and gas and industrial goods indexes all closed positive, while the banking, insurance and consumer goods indexes all declined. Global Spectrum Energy Services topped the gainers chart for this week, while industrial and medical gases Nigeria led the decliners. The trio of FBN Holdings, Transnational Corporation PLC and UBA contribute at 62.08% and 42.7% to the total volume and value traded in the week. 
Well, also, the NASD OTC Securities Exchange Index closed the week on a positive note. The NAST also rose by more than 3%. The exchange gained about 3 billion Naira in value. Also, volume rose by about 20% to 12.32 million units of shares traded, while value traded for the week rose by over 197% to 272.4 million Naira. Frisland, Campina, Wamco, Nigeria led four other gainers for the week, while Central Securities Clearing System was the only loser. Meanwhile, Central Securities Clearing System and City Trust Holdings were among top stocks traded by volume for this week. And that's business news. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Nwawadu. It's back to you, Melinda. And for what's happening in the world of sports, here is Ayotunde Balogun. Many thanks, Melinda. Team Nigeria have increased its gold medal to four at the ongoing Africa Senior Athletics Championships in Mauritius. Oyishade Olatoye threw 63.67 meters to claim gold in the women's hammer throw and to keep Team Nigeria in third place on the medals table. Zuina Buzbera of Algeria picked up silver, while Rawan Barakat settled for the bronze. In football, European champions Real Madrid FC have announced the signing of France midfielder Aurelien Chouameni from AS Monaco for a fee of $84 million, as well as an additional $21 million in bonuses. Chouameni, who had been linked with Liverpool, Manchester United and PSG, agreed a six-year deal with the Spanish champions and will undergo a medical next week. Chouameni was voted Young Player of the Year in the French League last season after making 46 appearances in all competitions for AS Monaco. He made nine of half appearances in total for Monaco during a two and a half seasons following his arrival from Bordeaux in January 2020. In Merseyside, Liverpool FC have reached a verbal agreement to buy Darwin Nunez from Benfica and are preparing the paperwork to complete the five-year deal. Liverpool will pay a guaranteed $105 million for the striker, meaning the Uruguayan could become their record signing. Virgil van Dijk's $92 million fee is the biggest paid by Liverpool, who have acted decisively for Nunez in the face of interest from Manchester United. Nunez was a top scorer in Portugal in the 2021-22 season with 26 league goals and scored 34 in total, including two against Liverpool in the UEFA Champions League. And that's Sports News. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. It's back to you, Melinda. Many thanks, Ayo. In the United States, thousands of protesters have gathered, calling for stricter gun laws in the wake of last month's shooting in Texas. According to gun safety group March for Our Lives, some 450 rallies are planned today all across the United States. The protests have been backed by President Joe Biden, who has called on Congress to pass common sense gun safety legislation. 21 people were killed in the shooting at the Rob Elementary School on May the 24th, 19 of them children. There have been more shooting this year in the United States before, and since that time, Mad for Our Lives has been accusing political leaders of killing Americans, insisting that they will no longer sit back while people continue to die. They are calling for an assault weapons ban, universal background checks for those trying to buy guns, and a national licensing system which would register gun owners, amongst other policies. Finally tonight, as part of activities to commemorate this year's Democracy Day tomorrow, that's June the 12th, the president is to make a nationwide broadcast at 7 a.m. Your dialing station, Channel's Television, will bring you that broadcast at the scheduled time. And the main news again. 11 out of 61 kidnapped persons 
during the March 28th train attack in Kaduna State. Today we gain their freedom from the hands of the abductors after over two months in captivity. The spokesman of Sheikh Gumi, who had been involved in the negotiation for their release, told Channel Television that the freed victims were six females and five males. That's the news at 10 tonight. I'm Melinda Kinlami. On behalf of the team, good night.